Welcome everyone, just a warm welcome to those that are watching us online. Uh, we probably get 12 or 13 individual watches online every week, so whoever you are, you're very welcome and it's nice to uh, welcome you to our church service. We're going to have one or two testimonies, just encouraging stories uh, before we start. God's always doing things and sometimes we're not the best at sharing those amazing things that God actually does. And uh, I think Ian said to me, why don't we share one or two of those stories of things that Jesus has been doing. Sometimes they're little things, sometimes they're bigger things. Um, and of course the guys that go out, I always say this uh, to us frequently, but when you go out and share, for, you know, you just stand in the street and, and wait and see who comes. It is remarkable how many times uh, you talk to people who are on that, it used to be called an angle scale, they're on that moving towards Christ. Some people, as you'll hear, ready to receive Christ, and many people are just, they're being drawn towards the person of Jesus. And uh, I, Anna had, Sasha had one of her friends around and uh, dad came and uh, if you want a dad to come in your house, you just say, we'd like a beer. <laughs> and uh, that was that till about nine o'clock, I think. And a beautiful man, I mean a scholar actually, uh, someone who in initially wanted to uh, be a Catholic priest, so someone who is dedicated, someone who can read ancient as well as Koine Greek, common Greek in the New Testament, uh, Latin, so I'm sitting in front of this person, but someone who is also drawn very much to Christ, someone who's maybe given up because of who knows what reasons, but is being drawn back to Christ, and I love sharing with him and talking to him because the presence in the room was strong, wasn't it? You know, Natasha was there. Even with a beer, you know, it reminded me of Jesus. He's eating and drinking with sinners, and I'm sure that alcohol was shared, and I'm sure that people were attracted to Jesus. And it, it was just one of those moments in times that it, it's just lovely to be a Christian and to be able to share. And I'm not saying he wasn't one, I don't know, but he's certainly coming back. Because our faith in Christ however it's expressed liturgically and, and I have many Catholic friends or if it's expressed with far more umph you know a, a Pentecostalism and I really love Bogota I just love people who love Jesus I love people who love Jesus I love people who express Christ in their daily life, people who show humility, people who are willing to serve and give of their time, their energy and their money. And these people come, you know, our Christian brothers and sisters from all over the place. And it's a big thing for me. I, I just want to love the church. And, and in, in the best, the most ideal place our church could ever sit would be a church, yes, that's some, somewhat bigger than we are now, but also a church that would just just fire start other churches a church that would just fire up other people that would bless and give blessing to the body of Christ so having said all that I don't know Mike do you want to or um, who else Ian why don't you come and share um, I wanted to share something about uh, what's happened in my recent uh, life back at the beginning of June I had um, numbness on the side of my head. It was like my finger wasn't working and I pressed the side of my head. And I started getting headaches that were waves of pain coming from over above my ear and going into the centre of my head. And they weren't like headaches that I'd had before. They, they were, um, you know, they're not like the tension headaches you get across the front of the forehead. Um, and, and it kind of like, I, I felt that there's something sinister going on, you know. I go in for the glass half full, uh, glass half empty rather than glass half full. Um, and I contacted my doctor. Uh, she rang me back the same day and spoke to me uh, on the phone. And then she said, I want to see you. So I went in that same day. Um, and she prescribed some tablets for me to uh, take the moment this headache come, comes on. And she was saying that they were cluster headaches. Um, uh, but she said she would contact a friend of hers, a neurologist, to find out 
whether there's something else that they might need to look at. She contacted me a couple of weeks later in the middle of June um, and she said um, it, it could be something or other else. Um, but a couple of weeks ago I mentioned it uh, at the end of the service to, to Jenny and, and Jenny got Chris on board to pray for me and um, he, prayed for the, he put his hand around the back of my neck because I've been feeling uh, tension in the back of my neck as well and the doctor has suggested physiotherapy for that and he put the hand on the back of the neck and prayed for me and I immediately felt a, felt a release uh, of my neck a, a freedom in my neck that I'd not uh, known for a long time for, for a while um, and it was completely healed and Chris would testify that even as he prayed he felt that there was power um, in, in that prayer uh, of praying for me so God healed, God's healed my, my, my neck and I haven't had those headaches uh, since then so glory to God Praise the Lord it's nothing to do with me of course but when when I grew up, I, I grew up, as you know, many of you in a Catholic uh, faith, and th that didn't harm me. And then I, I listened to John Wimber and joined the Vineyard, but it was him. I didn't join the denomination. I, I, I joined following him, really. And John used to say, if you think I'm a healer, come and follow me around, and you'll soon discover I'm not very good at healing the sick. But what he did say was, because I pray for hundreds of people, I see miracles. You have to pray for lots. Now, I wish to goodness when I prayed for Ian, I could just switch a little thing on in me and God would do that every time. I felt power leave my hand. The moment I put my hand on it, it's the end of the service. Some, sometimes at the end of church, you're full of beans, full of the spirit. Other times, and this was this time, you know, you're just ready to get home and have a quick you know, cup of tea as soon and just put your feet up. It's one of those. And so Ian said, so I said, yeah, I'll pray. But the power of God fell on him. And it, because I felt it leave, I felt the power leave my hand and go into Ian's head. And, and that is one of those things. Why doesn't God do it all the time? I don't know. But just to encourage you, because we're going to talk on this today, if you pray for lots of people, it's, it's, not, the, you know, it's not for the few, this. Um, you, you, just ha you, you literally have to put out your hand. And there are moments as well in my life when I think I've just spent too long talking with someone when I should have said, let's pray for you. Let me just pray for you. Let, let the anointing come. Let the presence of God and feel this. Because that's how people are transformed and changed. Sometimes I think I'm trying to argue them into the kingdom or it just doesn't work. So, Michael, why don't you come and share from yesterday's prayer chair? If you don't know, Michael goes out every week, virtually every week on prayer chair, but together with others. Tony here, Kareen's here, um, Jenny's here. And, and prayer chair is, is, is that, it's a chair in the street, would you like some prayer? And in some way, because no one really goes to church anymore, it's a way of people stopping and saying, actually, I would like some prayer, I would appreciate it. And then the surprise to them is when God turns up and does something. But there are many, many in our culture. I don't have to tell you how hurting our culture is right now. There's an enormous amount of pain in people, young and old. And this is just one way to go out there and say, and I would say if you're thinking of going, we're going all day on the 3rd of August, just come, just sit there. Someone will come and sit next to you and you pray for them. So, Michael. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, yesterday we went out in New Road um, and we were there for about three hours in the afternoon and we prayed with quite a lot of people. It was quite remarkable. As soon as we set up, uh, Chrissy was with us and virtually a lady just sat down next to her and uh, she offered prayer and started praying you know, into, her, into her situation. And then there was another situation. Uh, we, we had, uh, there's actually a Muslim couple were pushing a stroller and um, yes, Sanjeev was with us yesterday as well 
and he started praying with the gentleman and I think Tony was praying with, the, with his wife and the gentleman had a pain in his leg. He said he's, he, had, he had a lot of pain in his leg and so Sanjeev just prayed for his leg and all the pain left him. He said it was completely pain free. God had actually given him a miracle and, and then the explanation came that that is from Jesus. And so there's the opportunity to share the love of God and to share the gospel with that family, which is beautiful. And then Jenny and I, we ministered to a young man who was, um, who was feeling, you know, was suicidal. And uh, yeah, really lost hope and direction in his life and not knowing where to go. And he's, and he's become homeless and things have just gone wrong. So anyway, it was that we shared the love of Jesus with him. We shared the gospel. And he kind of, and he just, he, he sensed that you, there's hope. He sensed that there was something to live for. And he could sense as we prayed, he felt the presence of God just really touch him. He said, I could really feel that. I said, yeah, it's the presence of God. He loves you. He wants you to know that. And so he gave him a Bible. And I gave him a book on what it means to be born again as a, we collected a few of those from um, Rodney Howard Brown Conference. It's a great book. It uh, basically explains in detail a decision when people accept Jesus into their heart, what it really means. And we prayed with many other people. It was an incredible day. And we knew we, knew we were doing the right thing. We knew we were doing God's word because we had a, an older lady. She came past and she sort of went nuts. That's the best way I could say it. And apparently she's a JW, and uh, she started pointing to the sky and hurling abuse at us from about 30 feet away. And I thought, wow, yep, we're doing something, right, because we're stirring the enemy's camp. And, uh, but it was a great day. We, everyone came away feeling, wow, because often we go out, and we go out for the one, because people get saved one at a time. People are healed one at a time. When we go out, we encounter individuals and sometimes you'll be there and you'll know if you didn't pray for anyone else that day, you were meant to pray for that person. So it's a wonderful opportunity. So please come out on the 3rd of um, on the August in the seafront. It'll be near the, uh, near the pier. I think it's opposite the casino down there. Um, but it's a great day and, you know, it'll be, it's, it's pride on that day. So there's, there'll be lots of people down, but it's a fantastic day. Yeah, and Chris is offering to provide fish and chips at lunchtime. So you don't want to miss out on that. So uh, thank you. I, I had the healings on Friday uh, over in Tesco Ho. And we had a lady come in there that was very much in need of meeting with Jesus. Uh, and she'd already met him, but she had a problem in her childhood uh, with her parents. Uh, she had lost the love of her father. She felt she wasn't loved by her father. But I think she went away uh, feeling encouraged, feeling that she needed to get more in touch with Jesus again. Uh, and I think she'll be back to the healing room. So, healing is slightly different to prayer chair in the sense that we don't get as many people, we don't pray for as many people, but we do actually, when we pray for people, we find out what is underneath... You don't need to hold that. ...what is underneath the problem that they have. Uh, and uh, anyway, yesterday we also went out, it, kind of like a, a hybrid prayer chair yesterday, if you like, because we went out with the, the gazebo in Preston Park, and we saw a few people. We didn't have as many, probably as many as prayer chair, but because the footfall, as they call it, was not great. There wasn't too many people coming through Preston Park yesterday. But we did have some good conversations. We prayed with, um, with, one, with, uh, uh, with one or two people, probably about four actually over the, over the course of the day. It built up towards tea time, <laughs> because that's when people were starting to go home. And, and, and people just looked at, uh, I used to say they used to look, I said, do you want prayer? And they come over. Um, and there was one lady that particularly who was into Reiki and that kind of thing. Well, I disillusioned her of that and said, Jesus Christ is the only one that heals. Uh, and told her a little bit about that. Um, and 
Yes, Steve was there. We prayed for you, Steve. Did, did it have any effect on you at all? Huh? Come and show. I turned up at sort of, is that all right? I turned up at 3, what was that, 3.30, and uh, I was sort of feeling a bit anxious, and uh, I see Rodney and uh, Martin, and there were, oh, there was um, Janet who goes to Hangleton, to some church at Hangleton School Hall. That's better, isn't it? Uh, yeah, and, um, oh, oh, Mark, he does, um, healing rooms. Anyway, so I sort of looked at them all, I had a cup of tea and I was, and, and I said, I need prayer. They were sort of talking as if it was ending. It seemed to me that it was ending and I said, I've got to be sort of, uh, you know, forthright. And I said, uh, I need prayer. Anyway, and Mark was there, like I say. Uh, so they gave me prayer and uh, not mine, I'm not even going to say, I disowned my condition. Some, a lot of people know what my condition is, and uh, along with that, I will, I might as well say it, because there's, there's uh, bipolar, but there's bipolar 1, which is, has symptoms where someone can be, have a manic episode, so they, you know, in the extreme they could be uh, taken into hospital, or they could just be a bit psychotic sort of thing, but their depressive episodes are not so long, so that's mine, it's, it's, I, well, I'm high functioning, but I'm, I'm like a ever ever any battery. I go along until I hit a brick wall, and then I get a depressive episode, quite a long one, could be four to ten weeks. But I've I've, den I've just denounced. I've just said I'm not having that name anymore. Now, when I'm sort of um, not physically able, uh, when I'm having a depressive, so I have um, mental and physical fatigue. So I can get to the toilet and go and have a cup of tea and have a bit of cereal, but for having a shower, that's another thing you have this, it's quite a regular thing with people, um, prolonged illnesses. The thought of a shower, it just seems totally illogical. I don't like showering, and anyway, and consequently I get really bad arthritis. But and I have to take um, temp medication, well no, it's um, tablet form, it's glucosamine and some, something else sort of thing. Anyway, that seems to keep it, but it, if, I'm doing a, if I'm doing an arduous activity, then I, I get quite painful. I've, I'm like, me and, me and Rodney are sort of having a race, it's like two snails, isn't it? <clears throat> anyway, so I'm a bit like that, I can be like that. Anyway, it's just alleviated that, and I don't know what, because I'm on medication, it's like Mark said, you could, I've stopped medication, you can have a relapse, so, but I want to wean myself off it. But I feel that I'm on the road, so with the prayer from Rodney, I'm definitely on the road. Thank you. Well, come on. Let's get Um, I just want to praise God for what he's done with my mum and I want to thank um, all of you for praying for her because I know in all your different ways you come up to me and say I, I miss mum, where is she, is she okay and I'm praying for her so I don't take it for granted, it means so much. So mum's been in hospital for four and a half months for those of you that don't know her, that's why she hasn't been here. Really quick version, she moved from being in a house in Hove with me for seven years, you know I was like her living carer but not the whole seven years, it kind of got worse kind of last year. She then moved to an assisted living flat, if a lot of you know what that is in Crawley, where she's had a bit more assistance. Um, carers were going in and it wasn't working because she's been developing dementia since last September, but it's been quite rapid, some of the things I saw since last September I've never seen with my mum's conversations, because the conversations are very lucid, very, like, very um, in-depth about the charity, tell me about that event for the homeless and we'll, we'll chat for hours about it and we'll pray into it, and it all kind of stopped last September to the point where by Christmas mum couldn't remember how to boil water for Christmas dinner I had to jump in and so I don't want to get upset and then take over the Christmas dinner which is fine I, I don't mind I always want to help and wash up and but anyway so dementia has been developing but um, she's in this assisted living flat in Crawley in February then was put in hospital for four and a half months and the hospital deemed she was unsafe to herself she needed 24-hour care but she's been on a wait list for a care home I'm trying to just cut out a lot and get to the point sorry for time for sake of time um, because of, there's such a weight around the UK, you know, if people don't have five, ten thousand themselves to pay, you know, myself, my brother and sister, I wish we did, but 
just not in that income bracket to have got her out, so you're just subject to the wait list. The council told us you'll never get somewhere like Crawley or Horsham. My sister's in Crawley Down. I'm now in Storrington, um, over where Simon and all his family are, um, my fiance. So Horsham or Crawley would be perfect for my sister there. Horsham's right by Storrington. They said you'll never get it. There's never a single space. Horsham's the most sought after. It goes over the budget of the state. You'll have to pay a, a grand each a month, you, your brother and sister, about another three grand to get her in Horsham. The state will do a certain amount. So I was like, okay, that's fine. We're in a country where we even get any help. I'm blessed, you know, it's amazing. Horsham came up last week. The council said there's a place in Horsham. It's one of the best care homes we have. It never comes up. It's phenomenal. Viewed it Wednesday. Mum moved in Friday. And she's just like, her well-being is just, over a weekend, she talked to me on the phone this morning, didn't she, Simon? And her, like, her well-being, she's like, I want to go out shopping. I want you to go in a cab with me. Um, and like, take me out, let's get some new clothes. And she said, I've already been making friends. And and you've been there since Friday. But it's all of your prayers. It didn't just happen. Um, and, and the fact that Horsham never comes up or Crawley, they said she'll be somewhere like Cookfield or Hayward Teeth, which is fine, but I can't drive, as you know, all of you, I'm learning to drive. So I didn't want that to affect mum's well-being if I can't get there. So, but yeah, we've got the best location, the best care home. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. It's lovely, isn't it, just to hear these various stories, things that maybe otherwise we wouldn't hear. Right. I do. I, we're looking at main and plain, looking at things that are patently obvious in the Bible, but are not always patently obvious when you come into the Western Church and have a look at it. Um, we've looked at things um, as to how Jesus taught that we are meant to behave. We're meant to take least place. We're meant to favour others above ourselves. We're not meant to lord it over others. We're to live life for a perspective of the future. These are not complicated teachings of Jesus. You don't need a PhD in theology. You don't need to learn Greek. <clears throat> you can teach these to children and they will get it. But for some reason, these kinds of things are not in the church. And I think what God wants from all of us you know, we all, you know, we, preachers particularly, we'd all like to be a bit like Billy Graham and seeing thousands of people come to Christ. We would. But we also have to know, as Christians living in a world that is maybe looking a bit darker than it did before, to live lives commensurate with the kind of person that Jesus is. Holy lives, quiet lives, lives where we witness from time to time and pray for people from time to time and have influence on our neighbours and family and friends simply because we live the Christian life and we are Christians. And some people want to do that jumping up and down, some uh, more quietly, some more liturgically. Yet nevertheless, when opportunities arise, as they will in your life and mine, we share the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And I think many times this is how Christianity grows as well. It isn't just the, the preachers in the stadiums. That can stir things up. But those of you that, that will know the figures, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association looked at how many people who go forward actually end up in church, and it's hardly any. People end up in churches because they make friends, because they're invited in, um, and because they, they see the witness of Christ. So today I wanted to... <laughs> I've lost my Bible now, that's no good. Is it in there? New Testament, anyone? I put it. Oh, I, I know where. Matthew chapter 4, and we haven't got time to do everything um, that I wanted to do. But if we're to represent Jesus properly to our culture, to, then we're to do the things that Jesus did. Can we do them as well as he did them? I would probably say no. Jesus is God. God is walking around um, Galilee and the Decapolis and Judea. He is God, filled with the Spirit, given up his omniscience, but nevertheless is God and is able to perfectly fulfill whatever the sovereign will of his Father is. We aren't going to be able to do that exactly um, the same. 
Yet nevertheless, Christ expects the church to look like him. And the church is to have power and people are to recognize the power that's in the church. And so when Michael said, you know, they prayed for a Muslim family, lovely family, and the, the father is, you know, his leg is sick and his leg is healed. I think that's really the way that God promulgates his gospel. Uh, there's an awful lot of media and toxicity in media and, and all this sort of thing. But Jesus is beautiful. Jesus isn't intimidated by a culture, not in the slightest. Nor is he intimidated by some of the darker things that are coming into our culture, and neither should you be as children of the light. We mustn't be intimidated by the kind of the, the things that are coming into our culture and taking almost, it feels, center stage in our culture because we're children of light. We belong to him. And so when Jesus was walking around, Matthew um, gives us this wonderful little uh, snap, just this little, uh, almost a postcard of what Jesus was doing. And it says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases. Those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, it means the demonized, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from the Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan all followed him. Jesus had a, a massive impact as he began his ministry. And of course, the teachers of the law, the erudite, if you like, the people who held ecclesiastical power, they couldn't do this. They couldn't open the eyes of the blind. They couldn't get people out of wheelchairs or paralyzed. They couldn't do the stuff that Jesus did. And Jesus was doing this, this kind of thing to demonstrate that the kingdom of God, the rule of God, was now coming to planet Earth. And it was time for what the enemy had stolen, God was going to retake. And this kingdom has been advancing now ever since from that time. Intermittently, sometimes very strongly, sometimes very weakly. And I think in the West we are lulled into this, this false paradigm because God is not moving as much as we would like to, because the church isn't having the influence on the culture that we would like to. But we are to believe that God is going to do these things because he always has. And he can do it, because he can do anything. And when, it's, when he decides, he will move, and, he will, and we will see a church doing these things. This is the bread and butter of Christianity. Healing the sick, working miracles. This is the bread and butter of Jesus. And Hebrews tells us, doesn't he, in 13.8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. How shocking it is, how shocking it is in our culture that in some way or another, Jesus used to do stuff. The Jesus of history. Oh yeah, well he used to do stuff, but not today. And this is a lie. This is, this is not the Jesus that we worship. Healing the sick are, are the very main and plain things that Jesus wants us to endeavor to do and to try to do. And when we place our hands on people, when we pray for people, we don't know what God will be doing when we do that. Sometimes he does great things, sometimes seemingly nothing. But this is the will of God, of Christ Jesus. Of course, when we look at his life, Jesus did this stuff. And then when we look at the life of the early church, the early church did this stuff. The only reason the early church grew was because of the power of the Spirit. Healing the sick was, was again, the, the normative role of the apostles afterwards. When Philip, for example, in Acts chapter 8, and Philip was, was someone, wasn't he, um, He's called the evangelist. He goes into Samaria. And people paid close attention to Philip. Why? Because he was erudite. He gave five-point sermons. His PowerPoint slides looked amazing. There's no PowerPoints in those days. There's no PA. There's no technology. But Philip healed the sick. 
the culture will begin to take Christians seriously when the Christians themselves, when we take seriously the God who's over us, under us, on us, and just how much authority he's given us. I think, as Anne said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, out you go. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus Christ. Not to our political leaders. And I, I, I know who I would like, you know, and, and there's, there's not, no one to choose from. But it doesn't matter who the political leaders are. When this book was written, the church was persecuted, Nero. And if you want to know what Nero did to Christians, Tacitus, the Roman historian, tells us, just walks us through the terrible things, burning Christians alive just to provide some light in his garden, blaming them for the fire in Rome that he started, you see. Christians were now being noticed. But it doesn't matter who the boss is. It doesn't matter who's in power. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. These are the main and plain things. These are the things that I was taught so often as a, as a new Christian. Um, that these are the, th this is what excited me, to go out and to see God do this stuff. And he will do it from time to time through anyone, and it will increase. And you say, Chris, maybe that's just pie in the sky. Well, let's go to places in the world and see. Go to South America, go to Africa and see it. So, um, we'll almost close with this, but some of you will know Reinhard Bonker, a German man. Um, someone sold out for Christ, a man who I think at 15 years old was in London. He was going to go to Wales to a Bible college. Walking around London, he sees the nameplate of a man called George Jeffries or his brother Stephen. I think it was George Jeffries, who was an evangelist to Africa. So here he is at 15 years old. Can you imagine how excited he is to see the nameplate of this old man now, this man who's, who was to die just a few weeks later. So he knocks on the door and he said, is this the famous George Jeffries who went to Africa filling stadiums, healing the sick, casting out demons? And the woman, his, his, his uh, sort of caretaker, or what do you call housekeeper, said, yes it is but you can't come in because he's fragile he's old now and then he heard this voice let him in and he said he went into this darkened room 15 years and this man grabbed him by the collar as he went to sit down and pulled him to the floor and put his hands on his head and Reinhardt said it was like liquid gold running through him and he was to see that anointing come out of his life. He was to see that anointing displayed in his life in Africa for the rest of his ministry. And I know we've seen so many abuse cases, so many awful cases. You know, it's so wonderful to have a man who stayed to the end, who ran the race to the end. who was a godly man who lived and preached everything that he wanted to. So we're going to listen briefly um, to this man to say this God has done it in Africa the continent of Africa it, it is shocking to all the secular liberal 1970s academics who gave up on religion and Christianity and said it's finished and then to see the tens of millions of people coming to Christ the same in China the same in Sudan right now, the same in all of these different uh, South America, Argentina, Colombia, Brazil. You won't meet Brazilians who don't know Christians. They might not be a Christian, but they've met, surely met some. You find it, I, I, I pray, I spoke to some Chinese people, students, 20s. I said, do you know any Christians? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Not like this country. Do you know any Christians? People like, it's like they've never met one. No one's ever blown their cover. That isn't true in these other countries. The Christians are so salted into the culture and sharing. So let's have a quick listen to Reinhardt and then we'll almost close. When I was 19 years of age, as you heard, I started to preach the gospel. When I was 27, I went to Africa, from Germany to Africa. German is my background. 
And uh, when I arrived in Africa, things didn't go well. The people weren't interested in my preaching. I sometimes traveled half a day to preach in a church, and there were five people there. And not one of them wanted to get saved. It broke my heart. I fasted, I prayed, I cried to God, day and night. And then in one night, I had a dream. It was more than a dream. I saw a map of the continent of Africa. And I saw how that mighty continent became washed in the precious blood of Jesus. And I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit cry, Africa shall be saved. That got me more than out of bed. I left my position as a missionary. And I started a ministry. I was the only member of it with my wife. I called it Christ for all nations. And I didn't know how to start. I said, Africa shall be saved, Lord. Here I am. But I haven't got a clue how to start and where to start. But then the Holy Spirit led me. I, I, I don't want to tell you old stories. But it is a fantastic story. The Lord told me to rent a stadium. I said, Lord, that's wonderful. I always wanted to preach in a stadium, but the people never came. But if you say I'm to preach in the stadium, I will preach. I booked it by faith. The first night I had 100 people there. My nightmare was fulfilled. <laughs> I preached for 10, 15 minutes when suddenly things began to happen among those few people. Somebody jumped up and screamed, I've just been healed. Another one, another one, another one. And I thought, how can they interrupt my preaching? I hadn't prayed for the sick at all. I learned my first lesson right there, which is that I believe often Jesus cannot wait until we preachers have finished our boring sermons. He itches to do great things. That night a blind woman received a sight, a cripple walked, and after a few days that stadium was packed. I saw the first mass outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It shook me. I wept like a little kid. My God, my God, is it possible? And that day I knew Africa will only be saved through a might, mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That will break the devil's back. And this is... Reminder, see, God will keep sending these revivalists to the UK, to Western Europe, to remind us of what he's going to do and that he is going to do it. God loves people here as much as the continent of Africa, China, and elsewhere. But we have to believe God. We believe him from the scriptures. We believe him because he's prophesying this is what he wants to do, because this is the main and plain stuff. I remember many years ago, someone uh, prophesied over me, and they said, you are not a status quo Christian. Just pick, pick me out as they do, and stood me up and, and just said, he, he just saw holy unto the Lord on me or something and just said, but you are not a status quo Christian. And I'm not a status quo Christian. I hate the status quo. I really do. I loathe it. I think, gosh, Lord, I want you to do the great things. 
Remember when Philip in John 14, and I don't know what Jesus was thinking, we're going to close with this, but almost. <laughs> and he, Philip comes to Jesus and John, he says, show us the Father that we might believe in him. They've spent three years with Jesus. Show us the Father. And, and Jesus looks at Philip and, and says, Philip, don't you know me after so long? When you've seen me, you've seen him. You've seen the Father when you see me, is what Jesus said to Philip. We want to know what the Father's like. We want to know what our God in heaven is like. Look at the Son, Jesus Christ. This is our faith. This is the faith that we share. This is the absolute truth. What God is like, Jesus Christ. We read the Gospels, we get to know him, we get to understand him. This is our faith. He loves, and I love the way that Reinhardt put it, he is itching. God is itching to heal the sick. He's itching to win your friends and your neighbours and all of these people. He's itching. Don't be intimidated by the world. Don't come under the world's darkness. You know, this, the, the spirit... That, 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 you know, we fight an enemy who's very real, who will try and intimidate you and dampen down your enthusiasm for Jesus Christ. Don't let him. Because God is wanting to do these glorious things. And, and as you, we, we just watched, Reinhardt was desperate. He was fasting, he was calling out, he was desperate. Then God spoke to him. God wants it all. We have to be that kind of desperate but he wants to do the same things today as he's always done. It's in the book. That's how I know. Amen. So let's pray. Let's stand. And...